All right, this is part 16 of my series looking at Russ Miller's 50 Facts versus Darwinism in the Textbooks. Uh, we are going to start talking about tetrapod fossils here. This is going to get cool. Back to the textbooks. They say we have other transitional links, like the reptile-like amphibian Samoria. This was found in 1882. Well, that's not entirely accurate. Actually, the fossil beds in which Samoria were discovered uh, were first found in 1882, but the actual discovery didn't happen until later. And in fact, Samoria wasn't named formally as a genus until 1904 by Bowley. Um, however, the mistake reveals your source to me, which is good. But just the change in eggs would require the addition of a hard shell, a yolk, a biochemical change, and a completely new genital system for the amphibian. There's no way this took place. Scientists know of no way for nature to add the information. Wow, that's a really interesting little bit of information, Russ. Um, almost word for word from Denton and Gish, isn't it? Um, I, I want to know, how much do you actually know about the developmental biology and physiology of reptiles and amphibians, or more, more accurately, um, amphibians and amniotes? Um, I'm going to take a shot in the dark that you don't know fuck all about it. For example, uh, do you know that there's a frog alive today? that um, utilizes internal fertilization, that utilizes a leathery eggshell on the outside of its egg because its, its eggs are laid not in water but on land, right? And the tadpoles directly develop into, they hatch out as little frogs and they skip the tadpole phase. Um, they actually have a basically fair, a, what works as a chorion, um, almost an amnion, uh, in their egg, okay? Um, I forget the I forget the family. I'll if, if I think of it, I'll I have a paper on it. I'll put the link down in the description. Um, but this is a frog, right? It belongs to a well-known family of frogs, some of which have aquatic members and everything like that. Now, your boy Gish states that frogs are a kind, right? A kind, as in God created the frog kind, and they've subsequently split into all these different amazing forms, all remaining frogs, losing information along the way, but all being from the same kind. So that means that in the original frog, amphibian DNA was the instructions to make an egg, a reptile-like egg. That's one option. Or would you agree that just in some cases, maybe some of these transitions aren't as, aren't as difficult as you imagine them to be? And this scientist states, 99% of the biology of any organism resides in the soft anatomy which is inaccessible in a fossil. Bones will sing any song you want to hear. You can make up any story you want about these reptile bones, but they're not a missing link. Now let's look at your source. Now your source for all of that, the scientist you're talking about, is biochemist Michael Denton. And that's from his book, Evolution, A Theory and Crisis. Now, everything being equal, you can say, okay, fine, that, that's your source. Um, but I think it's important to add um, that I would suspect, because you're using that quote and you're a creationist, that you would agree that Michael Denton is a highly intelligent person, a professional, somebody whose viewpoint you would respect, right? You would, you, would, you know, certainly you're, you're utilizing them as a valid source. You're saying, look at this man. He says this, and he's pretty smart. He's, a, he's educated. He knows this, this field, right? I would, I would assume. You might want to check out his book called Nature's Destiny, wherein he retracts his view that all life isn't related to each other. In other words, while he remains, his faith remains, his belief in a higher power, his belief in a controlling force, um, he believes from that whole, what do you guys call it, molecules to man evolution from, you know, the amoeba that crawled out of the slime and the reptiles to, to mammals, to all of that. He supports all of that now, and he retracts his earlier position on it, claiming that he didn't know all of the facts, okay? Um, in other words, once he learned the facts, he has corrected himself, something that I personally admire him for, um, so this guy, um, an act, you know, the, an actual degreed scientist who used to support your position, now rejects it utterly and supports the idea 
that Samoria, or actually the Reptilia morphs, is is better. Samoria was was a derived later form, anyways. Um, but that the de- Reptilia morph clade gave rise to the true reptiles, the true amniotes. So um, I I had to laugh about that source. They say we also have the mammal-like reptiles, or the therapsids. Well, think about this. Mammals have a different heart than reptiles. They're warm-blooded. They produce milk. They have a different respiratory system and a complex internal temperature control system and other organs that reptiles do not have. And once again, science knows of no way for nature to add that kind of information. They appear suddenly in the fossil record and they disappeared just as suddenly. They were a very special critter that God had created. They didn't adapt well to the post-flood world and disappeared. Now, maybe I'm wrong here. I could be wrong. But I kind of get the impression from the way that you or that Russ discusses uh, therapsids that he sort of thinks that, you know, we have maybe a fossil or two, a, you know, a skull or some bones or something that we're calling therapsid, something a scientist dug out of the dirt and said, I will name it a therapsid. And I think it's the ancestor of mammals from reptiles. And that we, you know, that we long believed this to be the missing link until, of course, the great researcher Russ Miller comes along and, you know, proves us wrong. Ignoring the fact that the therapsids were a large and highly successful, hundreds of species known, probably many, many more we haven't found, um, but incredibly successful, uh, multiple families, multiple groups of them, lo- uh, really, really large, well-established clade of organisms, a clade of synapsids that existed, the therapsids were. Um, and the funny thing is, is you say they have, what is it, uh, uh, they appear suddenly? What? I, that's news to me. Apparently news to all the people at the Tree of Life Project and such, link down below. Um, who who do all the research about how they originated from the Polychiosauria, um, a, another large clade of, of synapsids. And in fact, the line between at what point in, at what point they say this is a true therapsid is debatable because it the transition spans millions of years and is really really smooth and very difficult. To, it's difficult to distinguish which is which at some points. Okay. Um, so to say appear out of nowhere, that's kind of the opposite of appeared out of nowhere. Um, and then disappeared suddenly as well. I don't know what your definition of disappeared suddenly is, but apparently... Um, Have you ever been shown the whale evolution series? Now, this is a real work of evolutionary art. And by the way, you should realize evolutionists are experts at drawing things that never existed in order to support their theory that never took place. Notice most of their supposed proofs are drawings. Drawings instead of research, Russ? Now, I don't know. Do you think that your audience is so pig-fucking-stupid that they think that they're going to believe you that scientists, evolutionary biologists, those who are actually studying and, and formulating the relationships between life on Earth, creating these nested hierarchies, are... For their source material, looking at drawings from high school and introductory college level biology textbooks, you think that that's, we're actually looking at these drawings as the source material? I mean, is your audience I, that stupid that they're going to believe that that's true? Um, I, I don't believe it. Oh, fuck. Who in the fuck am I kidding? I guess they probably are. They're listening to you. The whale evolution series is a good example. The first critter is just an extinct land mammal, had nothing to do with water. Well, he probably drank some every now and then. It's funny that you include Mesonicid in that lineage. Um, again, what this shows is is that you you don't actually consult the scientific material. That's the same bullshit that, that creationists have been putting out for, for, for decades, um, ignoring all of the new newer finds. Um, anyways, the Mesonicids were kicked out of the whale family tree in 2003. Um, that That's fully... Long before that, they were suspected to not fit. Uh, and, fossils aside, uh, they didn't make... It didn't make sense given what we knew about the biochemistry. Um, the hippos were looking like better whale-like ancestors, the hippos being derived... Hippo-like groups, like the Anthracotheria, being much better candidates for the ancestors of whales than the Mesonicids. 
But Ambulocetus is a real work of art. These are the bones found of Ambulocetus. The black bones were found in a different strata layer in a different location. They're not even from the same critter. But by putting the two sets of bones together, they came up with about 25% of a skeleton. It had no pelvic girdle. They don't know if it ran, flew, walked, swam, or what. But they said this is the missing link between the land animal and the whale. Okay, ignoring the fact that you're leaving out dozens of species um, in that little lineage of whales you're showing, um, I'm going to suspect it's not malicious. That's You just simply don't know any better because uh, you're cutting and pasting this from other sources. But... Um, Ambulocetus? Now, okay, so ambula now uh, that's really interesting to me. Ambulocetus was only known from that 25% of the skeleton, and, and we don't even have the, the hips. We don't know if it flew or swam or what. I, you see, I was completely unaware of that. Um, but luckily, I can check the original sources. I can actually check the original description of Ambulocetus, meaning when it, it, the, the person who first uncovered the bones, first described the bones, first named the species, and I'm going to see what they say. And it's, it's not that I don't trust you. Um, you've, you, you know, you've proven to be nothing but honest. You'd never be deceptive about something like this. All right, here's the skeleton that you show. You say it's about 25%. Fine, I guess that's a given. And that the black bones were from a different, um, different strata layer uh, altogether. Wow, that's, that's tr we, we really can't tell much from that. I mean, that, that, that's amazing. But let's just take a look at uh, Thewissen, uh, 1996 where he illustrates the original skeleton that was un uncovered. Uh, let's, let's see how that compares. Let's see here. Oh, here it is. Fuck you, Russ. Wait a second. Is it just me? Or am I seeing that maybe there's a little bit more of the skeleton than you're showing in your figure there? Let's look at them side by side. Yeah, I, I think there's a little bit more, including parts, oh, I don't know, like the fucking pelvis you said was absent. Now I know you didn't come up with this on your own. Okay, I'm 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 acute, I'm, I'm shouting at you about it, um, but in reality, uh, the original lie about Ambulocetus comes from Jonathan Zafardi of Answers in Genesis, who who did a whole debunking of Ambulocetus by showing that partial skeleton and then going, "How do they know it swam?" and all that kind of crap, um, deliberately leaving out the important parts of the skeleton. So, uh, again, Russ. Consult some original sources uh, before you spout this. And Bacillosaurus is actually a reptile-like creature. Bacillosaurus is a reptile-like creature? And Bacillosaurus is actually a reptile-like critter who is ten times that size. But if they drew him to scale, he wouldn't fit the propaganda, would he? Why would drawing it to scale destroy our evolutionary story or whatever it is you said? That doesn't even make sense. Is it possible that it's drawn to scale so that it, you know, fits on the fucking page? Is that possible, you know? Or, or does it all have to be a gigantic big Evo conspiracy? Um, because, you know, we don't think that anything can be larger or smaller than its ancestor or descendant. Is that, what, what are you even saying? Why don't they get the propaganda and the misleading information out of the textbooks and put in the real evolution evidence? Well, because they don't have any. Because they don't got any. Fuck you, Russ. What we, what we don't have is we don't have any evidence for evolution that you are willing or intelligent enough to actually look at and try to understand. That's what we don't have. The horse evolution series is the same way. The fossils have never been found in the order presented. The modern horse fossils have actually been found in layers below the supposed ancient horse. And even if this were true, and it's not, they'd just be horses producing horses, right? They'd just be micro-adaptations. They wouldn't be Darwinian evolution anyways. I love it how you guys parrot stuff you don't even begin to understand. Uh, the evolution of horses is extremely well resolved. Um, it's been resolved for some time. Uh, we know that it's much more complex. People have said that the original linear drawings that you see of the, the steps, the, the size progression in the steps and the toes and all of that, as simple as it was made out to be, isn't accurate because it's a lot more complex than that. But they've taken, scientists said it's not accurate and said, oh, horse evolution is inaccurate, ignoring the fact that they're saying, no, 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 that particular progression is inaccurate. Okay, we know a shitload about horse evolution. Um, again, link down below to a great summary of, of 
on horse evolution uh, that, that has a mo- the modern consensus on it based on the fossils and based on molecular analysis. So um, enjoy. <laughs>